Welcome to OLC 4.0, it's term 1A. Today we're looking at Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Great. Welcome to OLC 4.0, this is term 1A. We are on class 16, looking at assignment 24 and also how to use the dictionary today. I am Jillian Percy and it is Tuesday, October 1st. All right, all email, all assignments should be sent to studentwork at nnec.on.ca. That way the secretary has a record that you submitted the work and she can access it if anything were to happen to me. You've got another teacher who can get to it. Um, you always want to have your full name, the course name, the assignment number and the name if there's a name on every assignment. I know it's kind of a hassle to label everything that way, but sometimes we have people who take multiple courses. I have people that might have very similar names, so we wanna make sure we know who we're talking about, okay? Also important is please label the rough and the good draft of any writing assignment that asks for it. Now, not every assignment asks for it, right? But the major things where you're talking about essays and stuff like today, it's gonna ask for it and you need to include both of them and label it so I know which is which. If you want to ask me a question while I'm on the air, uh, the studio number is 1-800-465-7144. If you want to talk to me um, afterwards in the office, 1-800-667-3703, and my extension is 2211. If you have a question about an assignment, you can send me an email, jillian.percy at nnecschools.org, or also jillian.percy at nnec.on.ca. You can also send me a message on Facebook, capital G, capital P, E R C Y, space, capital W, A H S A. And previous classes are recorded and stored onto uh, YouTube, uh, capital G, capital P, E R C Y, space, capital W, A H S A. So if you go to YouTube, here's what my channel looks like. You can see just kind of very simple. Um, if you go to playlists, the very first playlist that will come up is this course. It's the 2024-2025 Term 1A. This course will get taught again at the very end of the year, but this is the course that will be available for most of the year. Down here, you'll see like 2B and 2A. Those are from last year. If you get ahead of us, like if you're already in Unit 3, for example, you could go in here and find the videos and look at those. Um, then... Uh, my boss is also putting together a WASA YouTube channel. It's kind of a mega channel with everybody's courses on it. It's still in progress, but our course is one of the ones that's on there. And that way, if you're like also taking a math course or uh, uh, some other course with us, you can just kind of access everything on the same page. Uh, but that's a playlist there as well. And here's the, um, the link for that if you're looking for that. Okay. Okay, so hang on a second. Learning goals, we're just kind of put these up here. By the end of today's class, you should be able to use appropriate strategies to expand your vocabulary through reading and writing, uh, explain the purposes and uses of opinion pieces of writing, use the knowledge of organizational structure of opinion pieces to identify opinions, main ideas and arguments and supporting details. Uh, Oh, we don't quite get to that today. We're not constructing a series of paragraphs. We are constructing one paragraph and we're gonna use appropriate strategies to organize ideas and information for writing, create a first draft that includes the main and supporting details in the required format. I'm sorry, I think that might be from a, the next class got kind of stuck in there. Okay, so the big thing today is using a dictionary as a spelling resource and also to discover the meaning of unfamiliar words. So um, a lot of times people think of dictionaries just a place to check your spelling, but they are a lot more than just a spelling reference. A good dictionary will tell you what parts of speech a word can be, all the meanings the word can have with each part of speech, common endings or word variations and the spellings thereof for things like adding an L-Y to turn a word into an adverb. It will often include example sentences. It may well include a synonym. Sometimes you might even have like a little word history if it's an important word that has a, a, a unique history. So if you are using a dictionary online, just enter the phrase online dictionary into your search engine. 
And when you do that, this is what came up on my screen. The first dictionary entry is just called like dictionary.com. It's kind of generic. If you see right underneath the search bar, or if you follow down the page, there's going to be more what I consider like name brand dictionaries. These are dictionaries that are written by uh, English professionals and have been used for literally hundreds of years. Things like Webster, Oxford, Cambridge. These are all very reliable dictionary companies that you can count on giving you um, solid information. So uh, because different dictionaries may show you slightly different information. So here is the Merriam-Webster setup. When you put in a word like commodious, it comes up, it gives you uh, the definition, comfortably or conveniently spacious, and then it gives you um, a synonym, roomy. It also tells you you could click on this link to get other synonyms. Archaic. Archaic means there's an older usage that's not in use anymore, where also meant something like handy or serviceable. And then it shows you that the word commodiously is the adverb and commodiousness is the noun. And then you could go down here and get uh, other, other parts of this. Um, Collins Dictionary, for example, for some strange reason, I was kind of confused by this. They tell you it's an adjective and there's a little um, megaphone here just to listen to it. They also show you how you could sound it out. But they give you the example first. A commodious room or house is large and has a lot of space. Then it tells you the synonyms. And then finally, after that, it tells you the meanings. I kind of found that kind of confusing, especially because on the page, I think there was like a big ad here. So at first you just see the sentence, which is a little confusing to me. They also mentioned it's archaic usage and they also mentioned the derived forms. I find that print dictionaries are far more thorough, but the online dictionaries can be very convenient, especially if you're already at your computer working on a writing assignment. So this is a talk, a video that talks about dictionaries and the print style. Um, YouTube's being a bit stricter about us including videos in our content, which is too bad because this is a really thorough video on how to use a dictionary, which sounds kind of funny, but it's actually not always super easy for people. Um, and if you decide you want to take a look at this, it's right there. You can look at it on your own. And uh, it's on the Merriam, um, Merriam Webster uh, website. Okay. So I'm going to kind of cover some of the basics that it covers because they're pretty thorough, but we're going to have to skip over the dictionary for now. So you can check the pronunciation of unfamiliar words. Check on the spelling of words, including when to add a suffix or a prefix. Explain what part of speech it is. Explain the different possible meanings of the word. This is one of the big ones. A lot of times we think of like the first meaning, but there might be like, depending on the word, sometimes five meanings, 10 meanings even. Uh, give you an example of the word in a sentence. Help you understand the difference between two different homophones. That's where they sound the same. And to help you understand the difference between two different homographs. That's where they look the same, but they're actually two completely different words. Okay, like think of like bat, like a baseball bat versus bat, the bat that flies. They really mean completely different things. So if you're checking a print dictionary for spelling or definition, flip to the right letter section first. Sometimes down the side, you'll see like a little color code, like all the A's would be red and then the B's would be blue. Um, but anyways, find that section first, then, Oh, uh, sometimes it's the very first letter that we're confused on, right? There are some sounds that are commonly confused. Vowels are one example, right? Sometimes we think a word might start with a certain letter, but actually there's a twin letter that sounds almost the same. So if you're looking for a word and you can't find it in the section you think it should be in, here are some of the possible kind of twins that it might be. So if it sounds like an I, like eh, it could also be an E, like E, eh, because those are so similar in our language. Same thing reverse. If it sounds like E, eh, it could actually be an I. A uh, for you could also be an A or A. Uh. The O could also be uh, a U. Some consonants, N could be an N, but it could be I-N or E-N. X could actually be E-X. L could be E-L or I-L. F might be EF and R might be AR. These are some of the tricky ones where we kind of are almost swallowing up the vowel um, because the name of it sounds the same as the sound. So it's kind of confusing there. So that's the thing to do if you're 
stuck and can't find a word you think should be there. So one thing um, they used to really teach us in school, I don't know if they still do, but when you're using a dictionary up top, you will see guide words. Sometimes they'll be together like this. Sometimes you'll see one up in one corner and the other up in the other corner. And usually what they're showing you is the very first one is the very first word on the page. And the second one is the very last word on the page. So they're letting you know, here are all the T words from the phrase together with down to tomography, okay? If the word you're looking for would be between those two words, then you're on the right page. If it's not, you're gonna have to go either earlier or later. So when you're using a dictionary, always look at the first two to three letters, maybe the first four letters in certain dictionaries. So for example, here we've got ascription to asperity, ascription, A-S-C, Asperity, A-S-P. So if I was looking up the word accept, A-C-C, -C, well, I'm going to need to be somewhere much sooner than this, like I'd need to be earlier in the book. But if I was looking up the word aspect, A-S-P, it might be right here. I'm going to kind of temporarily make this bigger so you can see what I mean. So in order to fit the, the thing on the page, I can't necessarily include everything. Okay, so here you go. You've got the word aspect, they've got how to pronounce it. Down here, they have these kind of funny little um, signs. Sorry, it's a bit blurry on my page. Um, and it's showing you how to say each sound. Then it's got like, see here, one A meaning, one B, two, three, three different meanings for the word aspect. It tells you where it comes from, the Latin, um, it gives you uh, how the adjective would be spelled. And then right underneath it, you're going to see the phrase aspect ratio, which is a completely different thing. Okay. So this is um, just kind of a useful thing to know if you're using a print dictionary. Now, okay, I'm going to put myself back to the normal size here. Hang on. So dictionary entries, there's usually a certain format and they don't generally explain it. There might be like a page early in the front that explains it really thoroughly, but some dictionaries might just assume that you know all the details and what they're trying to show you. So first off, here's the word mouthpiece and see how there's a, a space between mouth and piece. That's a syllable break. Here they're using um, a dot. Sometimes you might see a hyphen or a line. And it's just showing you that these are two separate syllables, mouth and piece. When I was a student in school, if you were writing, you were supposed to know when the syllable breaks were because you weren't supposed to stop a word in the middle of a syllable. So if I was writing mouthpiece and I ran out of room at my page MOU, I should have squeezed on the TH and then I could write piece in the next line, okay? It also helps when, you, when you're trying to um, pronounce it, mouthpiece. It tells you the part of speech, noun. Um, sometimes a word might have more than one part of speech. And in that case, each time you would see a new meaning, they might put the part of speech that it corresponds to. Cross-reference. That talks to where you might see another part of the dictionary that might use the word or might have a picture of the word. So here, bagpipes, recorders, and saxophones. Maybe there's pictures of a mouthpiece at those spots. Um, sample sentences, that's pretty common, so you can see how it looks. Progress, how are you progressing with your fitness program? Um, usage, that might tell you things like it's informal or it's slang, or derogatory would mean like it's an insult, or archaic would mean it's really old. So that might be there, not for every single word, but for a lot of words. Um, those numbers just mean the number of definitions, and that's kind of it on that page. Hang on, because the page continued. Pronunciation is usually given in parentheses. If the letters are following their typical sound, it's going to look exactly the same like this. If it's more atypical sounds, then you're going to see kind of those funky uh, little um, uh, sound things. Like, for example, R. The sound R is like, let's see here. Looking for the slash. Uh, it should be the forward slash, not the backslash, but I can't find it. I'm going to use the backslash just because there. Where is it? Oh, hang on a second. Okay, I'm going to put it up here just to kind of show you. Oh, or maybe not. Slash, R, slash. That means it's going to sound like an R, -er, but it might actually be spelled like W, R, or um, 
Now, WR is probably the most common as far as that goes. But when you're seeing it like this, it means everything's following its normal sound. But if you had a word like wrist, you might see it more like uh, R, I S T like that. And they're showing you that the W R makes the sound uh, R. Okay. It's kind of one of those tricky things. Um, if there's any related word forms, they'll tell you that. Here's where they might put homophones. Not all dictionaries might do that, but a lot will. Um, da -da -da. That's kind of the basics as far as that goes. Okay. Um, Canadian dictionaries. Uh, here's a whole list of common Canadian dictionaries. If you need a dictionary and don't have one, we do keep some here. Uh, if you have a learning center in your community, they almost certainly would have dictionaries there. So some common ones are the Canadian Oxford Dictionary, Collins Canadian Dictionary, a dictionary of Canadianisms on historical principles. That would mean it would include like historical phrases. That might be useful if you're reading like a textbook. Uh, Gage Canadian Dictionary, Houghton Mifflin Canadian Dictionary, uh, Nelson Canadian Dictionary, Penguin, uh, Reader's Digest, Webster's, and Winston. Those are some of the most common ones. Now, quick reminder about American spelling versus Canadian spelling. Some American print dictionaries are going to list the Canadian variant spelling, but not all will, okay? What also happens is when you're using online dictionaries, the default is almost always the American version. Occasionally, it will give you the option to choose Canadian English or British or English versus American English, but not always. So sometimes you'll find that your spell checker, for example, might mark Canadian spelling as wrong. Now, I will accept either version because I'm aware that people get kind of used to the spell checker being like, oh, it's the, it's the right way. Um, but some teachers might feel stricter about it. So let me see if I let me, if I put the word, let me see here, color. Okay, so normally it'll flag that as wrong because Americans spell color C-O-L-O-R, right? Now it's correct, but they think it's wrong because they're using American spelling. That is one of the most common issues. Um, there are a lot of British words where we have like O-U and the Americans drop the U. So things like honor, color, flavor, armor, we still tend to use the British format as far as that goes. Um, some other Canadianisms, um, we use RE spelling for words like have the er, like center, luster, specter, fiber. In American usage, it's more often spelled ER, okay? Having said that, I notice a lot of us mo have kind of switched over to that American usage probably because spell check marks these as wrong so often. Again, it's not a matter of importance to me. It could be a matter of importance to some of the people that you meet. Um, the other thing is uh, words starting with E that have a prefix in that ends in E are hyphenated in Canadian, but not in American. So re hyphen elect, re hyphen enter, re entry, re examine. The Americans just kind of run it together, which I think looks kind of funny, like re-elect. Um, I also have noticed in general, um, I don't know if it's spell check or Americans, but they don't like hyphens and they will often get rid of any hyphens, even when I know perfectly well that's a word that in Canadian um, spelling would have a hyphen. Um, if you are used to seeing a word spelled one way all the time, and I mean in writing, I don't mean like on Facebook, but suddenly spell check is telling you it's wrong, there's a really good chance that the difference is that you're spelling it the Canadian way, which is fine. And often you can say like Canadian spelling or something and check it if you want to. Again, I will look at either, but if you're confused as to why you might be seeing one version versus another version, that's actually why. Okay, homograph. Uh, homograph is a word that's spelled exactly the same as another word, but it has a different meaning. Sometimes they will sound the same, sometimes they don't. You have to pay attention to how it's used to make sure you understand which meaning is being used. So if I could say the little brown bat flew into the cave, obviously I mean a creature, right? The baseball player threw the bat down, I mean the sports equipment. I saw you at the store yesterday. I'm talking about my eyes, I looked, I saw you over there. My dad is using his new saw to build a shed. There I mean the tool called a saw. 
I am trying to train my dog to do tricks. Here's, we're talking about the action of training or teaching. My auntie left on a train to Winnipeg. There we're talking about the transportation. We saw a beautiful white crane by the lake. Here we're talking about the bird that is called a crane. I could also say the crane was lifting the windows up high. Here we're talking about the mechanical instrument that's also called a crane. Okay. Homograph. Homographs may sound exactly the same, but they may sound quite different. I'm going to like make the difference more obvious by putting both words in a sentence together. Sometimes these are ones that people have only like read. They haven't heard people use the word. So sometimes they're not aware that they have a slightly different pronunciation. Usually the difference is um, that they're putting the stress or the accent on the first part of the word as compared to the second part of the word or the other way around. So here we've got the farmer is going to produce some new leafy produce on his new on his farm. So here produce I say I emphasize the produce pro here produce I emphasize the deuce and it ends by being a slightly different sound. Since you are close, can you please close the gate? Here it's got a little bit of a Z sound in it. The lawyer said, I object to you bringing that irrelevant object into the courtroom. So here object is like I protest. Here object is like an item or a thing. When she heard her wedding dress tear on the nail, the tears began to fall down her face. So tear is like a rip, tears are like crying. I had to console my little brother when he broke his new game, console. So console is like to comfort, console would be like one of those control players. Now, the reason this comes up is sometimes when you're reading uh, a word and you're not thinking about the context, you might be thinking of the one version of the word when they actually meant the other version. And like, Object and object sounds so similar, it's not going to make a big difference. But tear versus tear is pretty different. It won't necessarily automatically come to me if I don't think about the context, okay? And then homophone. Right, these sound the same but look different and have different meanings. Right, spelled R-I-G-H-T versus right, R-I-T-E. Take a right turn at the gray house. Here, this is right as a direction. The priest gave him the last rites. This right is talking about like a ceremony or a symbol. Meet, M-E-E-T versus meet, M-E-A-T. Uh, the first one is talking about, um, keep wanting to use the same word. I can't wait to meet your dad, um, running into somebody new. Mom was cutting up moose meat. That one is the type that we eat. Rain versus rain, R-A-I-N versus R-E-I-G-N. R-A-I-N is about the water that comes from the sky. I don't want the rain to come. The other one with the E, the king will reign the country till he dies, is talking about ruling the country. Now, these are the kind of spelling mistakes that not all computer spell checkers will catch. Sometimes your grammar checker will catch those kind of mistakes, but not always, okay? All right, moving on. So here's an example. See, spell checker is saying pre-writing is wrong. I disagree. And so I'm going to go ignore and turn off that spell checker because I don't like that it's telling me to do that. You'll also see that come up sometimes where like um, like a, an, a, a different name, like pecanjicum. It might tell you, oh, that's not a real word. No, it is a real word. It just isn't an English word. And the dictionary's got English words. So it's not necessarily going to have every word from every language, because that would be an enormous dictionary, obviously. Um, I can use pre-writing strategies to generate ideas for writing. And I can use strategies to organize ideas and information for writing. Okay. So uh, this is one of those assignments that I've changed a fair bit from last year. The main idea is the same but it's got like A, B, and C parts to get across the same idea because we're having um, some difficulties. So it's not, I don't think it's still the same amount of marks. I think it's actually worth a lot more at this point. But anyways, 
Um, you've just been introduced to the concepts of skimming and scanning to find information without doing close reading. Now it's time to use what you've learned to write an information paragraph on a topic of your choice. For example, a topic might be how to start a campfire, how to clean a walleye, how to make bannock, how to change a tire on a truck. This is another piece that we're gonna be using in our portfolio. So we are gonna be using the writing process. Make sure you flip back through unit one to refresh your memory. We actually talk about it quite a bit, so I don't think you'll need to flip back. Um, this is also called a procedural or a how-to type of writing. The key point of this type of writing is that you're telling somebody the steps for how to do an activity, such as how to fillet a fish, rather than simply telling them all about something like, hey, let me tell you all everything I know about walleye. So you've probably read this type of procedural text all the time. It's really common. Um, some examples of typical procedural texts are things like recipes, craft instructions, repair instructions, building instructions, like, you know, you got a new shelf and it tells you how to build it, machine cleaning instructions, furniture building instructions, game instructions, COVID hand washing instructions. I'm going to show you a few different examples just so you have an idea of how they sound so that it's kind of hard to write something if you haven't heard how it sounds first. So here's an example. Um, Sometimes recipes will include an ingredient list as a separate thing, um, but then the instructions are a type of procedural writing. So here we have how to make classic sloppy joe recipe. First, in a skillet, add oil and heat over medium high heat. Once the oil is simmering, reduce heat to medium and add onions and salt and saute, often stirring until onions are translucent and beginning to brown around the edges about six to 10 minutes. I gotta be honest, if I was the... If I was the person, this isn't mine, I would totally be making them put a little period there and starting a new sentence, but that's okay. Then stir in garlic powder and chili powder and cook until fragrant, about 20 seconds. Next, add in the beef and use the back of a wooden spoon to break the meat apart. Cook until the meat is almost browned all the way through. Stir in brown sugar, tomato puree, ketchup, water, and Worcester sauce. Simmer the mixture until the sauce is thickened about five to 10 minutes. Finally, season mixture with pepper, serve on hamburger buns. So that's kind of how procedural writing sounds. Here's one, um, you'll often see this with drawing instructions and this type it might have like a little picture for each step. Step one, draw two C's. Step two, add U's to create branches. Step three, add upside down branches for roots and to create an owl burrow. Step four, add leaves, grass, flowers, and whatever else you want. We're not really doing pictures in our vision, but you could. And it's really common for pictures to be included in this type of writing, okay? Um, I'm not gonna stay here just because I wanna move on to the thing, but you could even show people how to do a social skill or a life skill. Now, uh, here's an example. For some reason, they wrote their example as, here, we're gonna write a paragraph on how to do an information paragraph. I think that's confusing, but I'm including it here so you can see it because that's what you might see in yours. Writing an information paragraph is easy to do if you follow these steps. The first thing you need to do is decide on a topic and come up with three or four points that support the topic. Next, you need to write a topic sentence that introduces your topic to your reader. From there, you turn the three or so points you've come up with on your topic into sentences that support the topic sentence. Finally, the last sentence in the information paragraph is a rewording of the topic sentence. All you need to do is finish your information paragraph is revise and then edit before writing the final copy. Following the above sentence will write a perfect information paragraph. Now, here's the thing. They put the first sentence in dark letters to show you that it's the topic sentence. The next part they put in red italics to show you, hey, here's the supporting details. Then they put the last sentence as our closing sentence. They underlined it. You don't have to do all that formatting. This is just because they're trying to get it across to you because you're not right in front of them, okay? I found this a little bit confusing. So I've split this up into different sections to kind of try and make it easier. Here is an easier to understand example, how to play ping pong. Playing ping pong is a fun and relaxing activity. Players stand at opposite ends of the table and are ready to hit the ball back and forth 
over the net at the center of the table. First, to begin a game, one player will serve the ball over the net towards the other player after hitting his or her side of the table first. The other player will then return the ball over the net and they keep hitting it back and forth until the ball either hits into the net or goes off the table. A point will be given to the player not making a mistake after each serve and players serve switch, switch serving after two points. Finally, a game is won with either 11 or 21 points. I don't understand that part. I wish they explained it. Ping pong is an enjoyable activity for fun and relaxation, good for people of all ages. Okay, so part A is worth 12 marks. This part, I'm kind of arranging it as like a structured brainstorming activity, or we might call it like a little graphic organizer. Basically, I ask questions and leave you a spot to put things. So some possible topics are listed below. You can write a procedural paragraph from these general categories. How to play a certain type of game, sports, videos, board games. How to cook something. How to do a certain type of craft or sewing, like making moccasins or doing beadwork. How to build or repair something, change a tire, repair a window, build a shelf. How to do a traditional First Nations activity, ice fishing, hunting, tracking. How to do or perform an artistic activity. Um, I'm going to say something that seems really obvious to me, but it wasn't obvious to some people last year. If something is illegal, please don't write to me about it. That's why I'm giving you these categories, right? Remember, this is still a school and you need to be choosing school appropriate um, assignments. All right. So here are just some ideas for topics for cooking, like how to make craft dinner, how to make moose stew, how to make bannock, how to make spaghetti, repair or fix, how to change a tire, how to change oil how to fix a broken window screen, how to fix a leaking faucet, Gra crafting, how to make a pillow, how to make a Christmas tree decoration, how to paint a tree, traditional activities, how to ice fish, how to set up a tent, how to make a fire, how to catch rabbits, um, games or sports, how to play flag, flag football, how to play a specific video game, how to steal a base. So, Pick a topic that you already understand how to do and it can explain easily to other people. Example, I would be terrible at teaching someone how to play football, but I could easily explain how to cook something. So take a few minutes to think about what comes easily to you, or is there a topic that people almost always ask for help with? Sometimes we underestimate ourselves and think, well, there's nothing that I really know about, but almost everybody has something they're good at, which would be helpful to others. So for example, the other, I have to say, the other day, a teenager I know who shall remain nameless um, was teaching me how to play a cool video game with beautiful graphics that I was interested in. I wanted to know how to play it. It's beautiful, but I'm terrible at video games. And he had to give me some very basic instructions on how to use the controller to move around the game and then how to problem solve when I got stuck because I don't play video games. Now, someone else might have thought, oh, this is so simple. There's no point. Nobody would need this, but I did need that information. Even something that seems really simple to you might turn into a very interesting paragraph. So here is an example of a recipe, how to cook a pot roast in a slow cooker. Want to make a perfect pot roast that never burns or goes dry? Here's how. First, make sure you brown your roast on all sides in a frying pan. Next, slice up an onion and put it in the slow cooker. Then put the roast on top of the onions. After that, peel and cut up some carrots and potatoes. Add them on top of the meat as they don't take as long to cook. The next step is to add some salt and pepper to the roast. Pour some beef broth over the meat, at least two inches worth. Finally, put the lid on and set the timer, usually six to eight hours in the slow setting. We'll make a tender pot roast for your supper. Once you taste slow cooker pot roast, you will never go back to using your oven. So super easy, but here is the questions. Number one, decide what topic you're going to write about. Remember, it needs to have steps that can be explained and the sequence. In other words, you should be able to put it in order. Use the topic as your title. So that's one mark. Pick your topic. Number two, come up with a topic sentence or an opening sentence that will allow you to describe how to. For me, I wrote, want to make a perfect pot roast that never burns or goes dry. So how to make a perfect pot roast. Do you want to know how to? Either way, it kind of comes up to the same thing. Um, and that's your first paragraph. You're going to write it right here, though. Don't worry about the paragraph. Then number three, come up with four to six steps that are needed to complete the process and fill them in on the organizer. This is the organizer right here, okay? One mark for each of the four sentences and another mark for each sentence that shows 
an appropriate amount of detail and clarity. Okay, so here's what I mean. Sometimes people will see something like, um, stir it. Well, okay, it's a sentence. I mean, it is, but you haven't really put the appropriate amount of detail, right? So I might instead say, stir the wet ingredients into the dry until thoroughly mixed. Okay, one mark for this sentence. I would give you two marks for this sentence because it's a much better sentence. So try to be mindful of writing adult uh, detailed sentences. And then finally, for the concluding or the last sentence, simply rephrase the topic sentence using different words that convey the same idea. So up here I used, uh, once you taste your slow cooker pot roast, you'll never go back to using your oven. Um, I could put something like, if you followed all these steps correctly, you too will have that perfect pot roast. It doesn't really matter. You don't want it to sound exactly the same as the first sentence, because that's kind of boring but you do kind of want to wrap it up. And this is sort of the traditional way that we wrap up these kind of paragraphs, okay? So that those four sections are part A and you get 12 marks for that. When you're doing this, here are some phrases that can help signal that that final sentence is wrapping up. Things like finally, lastly, to finish, to wrap things up, to complete the project for the last step, to conclude, in conclusion, the finishing touch is you win when you are done when, all those kind of things. All right, next we're looking at, I can create a first draft in the required format. I can construct clear, complete information paragraphs for a variety of purposes using correct paragraph structure. I can revise drafts to be sure that ideas are presented in a logical order. Okay, so part B is eight marks, but this is really important. Before you do any more writing on part A, before you make any kind of corrections or revisions, please photocopy it or take a picture of it and send it to me so I can read it. Once you've got it all marked up, it's really hard for me to read and it's hard for me to give you marks, okay? So please, please, please do that, all right? Now you go through that paragraph or, you know, it's not a paragraph yet, it's just kind of all set up as in your organizer. Go through that and make all the possible corrections you can make. You get one mark for each different type of revision for a total of eight possible marks. I'm gonna show you the revisions possible in the next line. Underline the revisions you've made and send me a copy of this section with the revisions on it. Don't send me the beautiful one yet. I wanna see all the revisions first. So here's an example. I originally had put the stove on to 350 degrees. Here I, I add it to the little care that means add first comma and then that means I change the capital P to a smaller P first put the stove on to 350 degrees so yours will look like that it'll see little corrections that's why I'm saying it gets hard to read so send me the clean copy before you send me those okay there are nine different types of revisions you can make you need to use at least eight of them you cannot use the same one eight times. So in other words, you can't fix eight spelling words and expect eight marks. I won't do that. I will only give you one mark. Now, obviously, if you have eight spelling mistakes, fix them all. But you're getting the mark for each step, not for each thing you fix, okay? So possible revisions are adding a transition phrase, revising the closing or opening sentence to make it more interesting, adding further details or revising your words to make the steps more clear, adding an extra step or an example to help clarify the meaning, adding adjectives or adverb phrases or clauses to add more information and description, create a compound or complex sentence out of two simpler sentences, use synonyms to polish up ordinary or repetitious words, correct any misspelled words, and correct your any capitalization or punctuation errors. Okay, so I'm gonna go through and talk about how to do each one of these types of corrections, okay? Adding a transition phrase or sequence words. These are really general or generic words that can help show the sequence of steps for an activity. Things like to begin or at the beginning, to start, get started by, 
next then after that we were talked about finally at last conclude if you're trying to add one more step in addition plus also as an option some people like to as well those are all ideas or word phrases that tell you hey i'm going to give you a little bit more information here and it, you just kind of put it as a as a phrase in front of your main phrase and add a little comma to show that it's not the main part of the sentence uh, revising your opening and closing sentences to make them more in interesting. There's a lot of small ways that you can revise those sentences that will help get across the exact same idea, but just a little more, for, more fun to read. So my original opening sentence was, here's how to make an easy pot roast for your family. And then I tried to kind of jazz it up and say, want to make a perfect pot roast that never burns or goes dry? Here's how, which is technically two sentences, but it kind of gets the idea across. Um, a closing sentence, I'm still trying to get across the idea that this is a great pot roast recipe. You will be surprised how much easier it is to cook a pot roast in a slow cooker. Once you taste pot, slow cooker pot roast, you will never go back to using your oven. I wouldn't use both of those, I'm choosing them. I'm picking one, right? Number three. I've added further details or I've revised my words to make my ideas more clear. Sometimes people are a bit vague, they're writing quickly, maybe they used a pronoun that made sense in their head but it's a little bit unclear when you're writing or reading it. So like put it in the cups now, well what's the it, what cups, what are we talking about? You might need to be more specific, things like put one third of a cup of the batter into each section of the cupcake pan. It's the same step, but you've become much more detailed. You might add things about a specific tool, a measurement, an extra step. So if I said, cut the wood to size, you might know what that means, but maybe I need to be more specific for the reader. Cut the wood for the shelves to 18 inches each. Number four, add in an extra step or example to help clarify your meaning. Maybe in the original version, you assumed people would know a certain step, and so you decided to add some extra information. Like maybe I just wrote, finally, cast your fishing rod into the water and enjoy fishing. But if I've never been fishing before, I might be standing there a long time and never catch any fish because you kind of left off some information. So here I've written some more information. In. Next, catch, cast your fishing rod into the water, Remember that you will need to jiggle it up and down to make your lure look alive and interesting to other fish. If no bites occur, try casting again in a slightly different spot. So here I've kind of added an example or explained my step a little more details. Okay, that's kind of what I'm looking for there. Number five, added adjectives or adverb phrases to help clarify meaning. So my rough draft might have said something like, cut the ears out of brown paper. And I revise it to say, cut the ears out of the dark brown paper, carefully shaping them as rounded triangles. By the way, I'm suddenly reading this and thinking it sounds kind of dark or gloomy, but when I was thinking this, I was picturing like a craft project for like a little bear or a little dog, like a little paper thing like you would do in school. But it sounds a little bit odd talking about cutting ears now that I'm looking at it. It made sense to me when I was looking at it the first time. That's what I'm talking about is sometimes when we go back, it's like, oh, you know what? Totally clear to me, not always clear to my reader. Number six, create a compound or complex sentence out of two simpler sentences. So first, stir in the wet ingredients, period. Then stir in your chocolate chips. That's fine, but I could just put it all in one big sentence. First, stir in your wet ingredients, comma, then stir in your chocolate chips. Same thing here. First, gather your tools, period. Gather up your materials, too. First, gather up your tools and gather up the materials you need to, oh, hang on, wrong two, in order to be sure you have everything you need. And so I added some more words, too, to make it more interesting. Use synonyms to pull up ordinary or repetitious words. We're actually going to talk about how to use a thesaurus next class. It's a lot like using a dictionary, really. Sometimes we get kind of stuck on a word, and when we're first writing, we just end up using that word over and over because we can't think of another word that means the same thing. But too much repetition of the same word can actually kind of annoy or bore your reader. 
and they can kind of tune out on what you're trying to say to them. And this is where the source is so useful. So here, the first one is my sample paragraph. Craft your opening sentence carefully. Your opening sentence must explain your main idea. The opening sentence must be the first sentence in your paragraph. The opening sentence must catch your reader's attention. That is so tedious to read. And I can easily change it and make it more interesting by brainstorming for a minute, checking the thesaurus, whatever, just so it's not so same, 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 right? Craft your first sentence carefully. This opening sentence must explain your main idea. This topic sentence must catch your reader's attention. I completely got rid of one whole sentence because the moment I said, craft your first sentence carefully, I've already told them it's gonna be the first sentence. So I got first, opening, topic. They all have kind of the same meaning in this context. They wouldn't necessarily in another place, but they do here. So that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Number eight, correct misspelled words. Try to be aware of what words you use commonly give you trouble, right? A lot of times, most of us when we're writing, we kind of use our same word bank all the time. It's pretty common just because we're comfortable with that. But there's always words that we use where it's like, oh, I always forget that word. How is it spelled properly, right? A very common spelling error is we've put one letter where it needs to be a double letter, or we've put two letters where it only needs to be one letter, okay? So occasionally, I always forget, is it two Cs? Oh, so here it is, it's two Cs and then two Ls. Sometimes I forget and try and put two Ss there too, but it doesn't need them. Difficult, this one just has two Fs, okay? So again, I'm using spell checker, so it's showing me, but if you were writing that, it might be more hard. The other really common spelling errors are two, two, and two. I, I did it myself today. Um, T-O-O -O is like also, T-O is like the location, and T-W-O is, oh, I'm not, that's one, that's weird, is the number. I must have lost something there. And then there, there, and there. The first there, T-H-E-R-E -E is location. E-I-R is ownership, it belongs to them. And then apostrophe RE is uh, a short form of they and R. Okay, I think we're gonna almost there. Uh, number nine, correct the capitalization and punctuation. The big thing to look for for capitalization, for some reason, a lot of people still forget to make the I a capital I if it's talking about yourself. Okay, I'm saying I am going to the store, then I use a capital I. I wouldn't need to have a capital I here with the word contractions because it's in the middle of a sentence. It also works for things like I'm, I'll, I'd. Sometimes people remember when I is by itself, but they forget to do it when they put it in a contraction. The other big thing is capitalizing the beginning of a sentence, okay? Be careful. Sometimes people's handwriting, like they'll do a small m, and if they were writing the capital M, they don't necessarily, so hang on, let me show you. See how this capital M is a point? It's a little bit bigger. Some people instead just do this type of M. Hang on, copy it and make it a little bit bigger. Almost out of time. Oh, why is it doing that? There we go. And they just do this. And that's tricky. If it's really obvious, then I'll know it's your capital letter. But if it's tiny and not so obvious, I'm going to mark it as a mistake. So be careful with your handwriting if you don't follow the normal or the typical way we do capital letters, okay? Um, also, don't add a capital after a comma. It's not needed. The other big thing is punctuation. Please remember to end a sentence with a period, never a comma. We cannot use two co a comma to join two sentences. You have to have a conjunction with it. Also apostrophes. Some people aren't sure and they kind of throw them in there um, wherever. Um, we either use it for two reasons. To show a letter is missing, like um, uh, wheel, we, W-E, apostrophe, L-L. I'm missing uh, the letters W-I. Or I can show belonging, like apostrophe S means um, the food belongs to the cats, 
birds with apostrophe means the cries are part of the birds. That's the kind of example. I am out of time. So we will have to cover part C of this tomorrow. Okay. Thank you so much for coming out. And uh, I will talk to you guys on Wednesday.